All right, so we just finished Psychology is Born, and we're going to make a little side trip into uh, evolution. All right, here's the drill. Um, evolution is a biological process, a uh, biological theory. I'm going to leave that alone. Um, but what we find is that it is a foundational principle in not, I mean, understanding and knowledge of evolution forms a foundational core principle of both the field of biology but also the field of psychology. You cannot understand psychology without understanding evolution. Um, trust me, you take another one of my classes, in particular something like Senior Capstone, and you're going to hear about it. We're just cavemen running around. You want to understand how humans behave, you got to understand the caveman inside of us and all our behaviors are because they allowed our ancestors to survive. But that's for another class. But anyway, Darwinian, Darwinian thinking uh, greatly influenced, in particular, as I had already sort of mentioned very briefly, in fact, I, I got my discussions out of, out, of, out of order in my mind, towards the end of the last presentation, when psych, uh, uh, early approaches to psychology, we made reference to functionalism, and in functionalism, as we said, their primary concern is not going to be what are the elements of consciousness, but rather, what is the function? of consciousness. Why does it exist? Okay? And you want to talk about function and purpose, talk about evolution. Okay? First thing is everybody um granted there's still gonna be a couple of fundamentalists who are gonna say that uh evolution isn't real, right? But even in Darwin's age, every academic knew evolution was real. All right, you go all the way back to ancient Greece, and my, even in ancient Greece, I think Aristotle wasn't hip to it, but even in ancient Greece, most of the ancient philosophers knew about this evolution thing. What was debated was the question of how does it happen? So you notice this is not necessarily, Darwin did not discover evolution. Nobody Anybody thinks that, they're full of baloney. Darwin instead put together the theory to explain it. Okay? The theory that we currently uh, hold to. Well, before uh, Darwin, the, the biggest uh, theory of evolution had to do with Jean Lamarck. He's a nice little French dude. He found that... Um, evolution occurred through inheritance, and it was like this... If a, here's this little silly giraffe. Let's say you show the giraffe on the far left here, and this giraffe is hungry. So he stretches his neck a little bit to try to get higher leaves. Ah! And the act of stretching his neck to get higher leaves stretches out the vertebrae in his neck. And we know that's true. You can do that. You can, you can work your muscles and joint bones and stuff and change them through things that you do. But here's the deal. Once this giraffe has stretched its neck out, when it has babies, its babies will have a longer neck as a result of what it did. It sounds kind of silly because, I mean, you think about it and you go, okay, so if mom gets a tattoo, then when the baby's born, the baby will have a tattoo. And I was like, okay, that's just stupid, right? And so for a hundred years, people have been laughing at Jean Lamarck, but recent discoveries in the field of um, epigenetics have shown us that, you know what, Lamarck may well have been on track. And again, in, in another class, I'll definitely take and run, run with this idea, but it's, it's not appropriate for the history of psychology. So Darwin was born with a big family, and uh, he was a relatively rich family. It's... Um, he, he had a passion for entomology, like bug studies and stuff, but he was in school for religion. He was in school to be, a, in college, to be a, um, a, pa a pastor, okay? He didn't really want to do this, okay? What, his studies didn't particularly interest him. He was out on his weekends and afternoons out in the woods and stuff. And this passion for entomology, so he's an amateur naturalist. And this, this stuff, I mean, he just loves this. He gets together with professors of botany and geology, in particular a guy named Henslow. Okay? And so Henslow, um, Henslow is a naturalist, a uh, botanist or something, I can't remember. And so Henslow is offered his job. Okay? Um, the, the ship, the HMS Beagle, is about to take off, and in fact, um, 
very briefly, the HMS Beagle had gone on a prior voyage and had done a rough mapping of the coastline of South America, and now the HMS Beagle, after having come back from the first voyage, was going to go out on a second voyage to go and map in detail the coasts of South America. Okay, so all of the inlets and channels and everything along the coast of South America so that the Royal Navy would have a very accurate map. Okay, so... On this trip, though, um, the captain, Captain Fitzroy, he is an incredible Christian. And again, um, the story is quite phenomenal. Because Captain Fitzroy, on the prior voyage, had picked up some natives from South America, from Tierra del Fuego, the little group of islands at the very tip of South America. He had picked them up on his previous voyage because he believed, um, Captain Fitzroy believed that Christianity was by definition perfect and the only reason anybody in this world is not Christian is because they just haven't heard about it yet so he picked up these uh, residents of Tierra del Fuego there's like three of them Jemima Basket and I can't remember the names but it was a good story and so he had brought them back to England with him to civilize them and to teach them Christian t thinking right and so he had dressed them all up and they were they were the toast of the town you know there's showing them all around, and then Fitzroy wanted to, um, as part of this voyage for, again, the Royal Navy was paying to, um, to map these inlets and channels and get great maps of South America, but Fitzroy had as his personal goal, as his Christian goal, that he wanted to show that he could take these Fuegians, right, the residents of Tierra del Fuego, these Fuegians, back to Tierra del Fuego, put them back, and watch Christianity grow, okay, because Obviously, that's what's going to happen because, of course, Christianity is perfect, says Fitzroy. So he sends, he, he on this trip, right, um, Henslow, he is uh, offered the position of ship's naturalist by Captain Fitzroy because um, Fitzroy wants uh, proof. He wants natural proof, proof from the natural world about the, um, the, 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 because the, remember, I mean, evol evolution is, is strongly contested and argued and debated at this point in history. And uh, clearly what uh, Fitzroy wanted was ev evidence against evolution. That was, that was a main reason he wanted a naturalist. Well, Henslow was a married guy and his wife says no, all right? His wife says, are you kidding me? You're not going on a five-year voyage. So he says, Charles, I got this kid, or he says to Captain Fitzroy, I got this kid, Charles Darwin, that I work with, you know, we go out and collect bugs and stuff, they did all kinds of crazy stuff together out there, check him out, he's cool, okay, so Darwin's father says no, and oh, two reasons, one, it's too much money, and one, it's too much money, and two, you know what's going to happen is this voyage is going to take away from the time that you uh, take your vows, your priest vows, okay? you, you got to get started in life because there's no way you're ever going to grow up and mature. So Darwin is just, he's desperate. He goes to his uncle, Uncle Joe, Josiah Wedgwood, Wedgwood, like uh, the Wedgwood China Company. And he goes to his uncle, Josiah Wedgwood, and he begs him. And his uncle sends him a note to his father, says, look, I'll pay for the trip. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of the money. I think you should let your son go because it would really be good for him to grow up and sow his wild oats and etc. So his father says, okay, you promise the moment you get off that boat, you're going to become a priest. And he's like, yes, yes, dad, I will, I will, I will. Thank you, dad, thank you, okay? So he gets up on this, this boat. It's a five-year expedition. It turned quite large, okay? And so at the beginning, Darwin actually believed in the biblical account. But here's the problem, okay? A couple of well, a couple of questions out there. But um, here's the thing. Now he's starting to get some ideas. See, he he had learned in his trips with Henslow and other other friends from the university there. He had learned some stuff about geology and stuff. He had learned about like stratification. He had learned that um, if you look at the the layers, the geological layers of rock, and say for example, if you find a fossil in you know England and it's here at this level in the geology and then you go all the way over to Wales and you find a fossil in the same ge geologic layer then they are about the same age gotcha this is an important principle okay so even though they're on opposite sides of the of the island the they're about the same age Ooh, crazy as he's getting on board 
he's given a gift, right? Henslow gives him this book called The Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. And this book was a really an interesting read for him because he finally, he reads this thing and he not only he gets a better understanding of how stratification works, but it implies to him the Earth is more than 4 billion years old. Now, this is a real problem because at this point in history, the Christians had a set date for when the Earth was formed and it was like 5,000 B.C. or something. I don't remember what it is. But really, it comes down to the Earth is like 7,000 years old or something. And all of these, if the Earth is 7,000 years old, when the heck did you have enough time for all of these crazy shit that the evolutionists are arguing? And so Lyle had laid out what Darwin felt was a convincing argument that, the, in fact, the Earth was way more than 4 billion years old, which is plenty of time for all of this crazy stuff to happen. Now... On this voyage, it was actually quite an interesting voyage because it was, um, on this voyage what would happen is, like, uh, Fitzroy would go to a particular port in South America, Darwin would get off, okay, and Fitzroy would say, okay, he, Fitzroy's job, like I said, was to do a very detailed mapping of all these inlets and channels and the whole coastline of South America, so he would say to Darwin, okay, look, in one month, meet me you know, 20 miles down the coast. All you got to do is go down 20 miles in the next month. And Fitzroy's job would be to detailed map the whole coastline during that month, and then after a month, he would meet Darwin. And Darwin, meanwhile, is going out and checking out all of these, um, checking out the nature. He's bringing back fossils. He's bringing back all kinds of crazy shells. He's bringing back all of this stuff. So he, remember now, Darwin had just been invited on the boat. He was not even a, an official crew, okay? You know, the Royal Navy probably would have frowned quite a bit on Fitzroy's personal use here. Um, and by the way, stepping back, the reason, one of the main reasons Fitzroy wanted this naturalist was, of course, to help support his evolution, but, but also because Fitzroy was a gentleman. And uh, the crew on a Royal Naval vessel at that point were not gentlemen. <laughs> And Fitzroy wanted to have a dinner companion, somebody he could talk to, somebody he could have an educated conversation with. And that was really Darwin's job, okay? So meanwhile, Darwin had a small little room on the ship, and he had all of these fossils, and it was just, he was filling the crew quarters. They were pissed at him. And so he would... Um, Anytime uh, there was a passing ship going back to England, he would say, Look, I'll pay you some money take these fossils. Meanwhile, he's having to send letters back to his dad. I need more money. I need more money. He just keeps spending money on, um, on renting space on passing ships to send his fossils and stuff back. Meanwhile, he's catalogs. I mean, he, he, he's, he doesn't have time to really organize his stuff, but he's just collecting, collecting, and collecting, but he tags everything with names, who it should go to. So, Everything is going back to England and is being studied. This whole five years that Darwin's out on his boat, all of these fossils, all of this stuff is going back. Okay? So, m closer towards the end of the trip, they go out to the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands are actually off the coast of, um, off the, the west coast of South America, but they belong currently to Cabo Chile. Chile? Ecuador. Ecuador owns them at this point. And maybe, I bet you Ecuador owned them then, too. But anyway, he found that on these islands, I mean, he found a lot of things. This is just one of his most famous. He found on these islands, these Galapagos Islands, that on each island, they had a very closely related animals, these finches that were related, that were very similar to each other in so many ways. But the major difference between these finches was the shape of their beak. And so Darwin studied them and looked at them, and, and he came to the conclusion that the main food source on each of these islands was different. On some islands, the main food source was nuts, and on some islands, the main food source is seeds, and on some islands, the main food source is uh, uh, insects that are buried in the wood and stuff. And what he found is that they had a different shaped beak based on what their main food source was. So, in other words, the beaks were sort of adapted, if we shall, to meet their local needs. Another interesting little character that really influenced um, Darwin was this guy. He was actually a, uh, again, he was a, uh, past, uh, a British pastor, not a pastor, but whatever their word is, I forget the word, parson. He's a parson, all right. He's a British parson, 
And Thomas Malthus is a writes on this economy. He's an economist in a lot of ways, okay? And so he writes this thing, Essay on the Principle of Population. And again, it's a it's quite a large book, but really comes down to this. The world's food supply tends to increase arithmetically, whereas populations, whether they be human or otherwise, tend to increase geometrically. Now, Thomas Malthus is writing about humans, okay? Darwin expands this idea to include animals. He says, check it out. Food supply grows at a fairly constant rate, or perhaps even at a, a non-rate in the wild, whereas populations continue to grow. And here's the problem. Any time that population exceeds food supply, somebody's going to die. Okay? If you have more animals than you have food to feed them, somebody will die. And so what we find is that... This creates the core of evolutionary thinking, which is the struggle for survival, okay? The reproductive capacity of all organisms allows for more offspring than the environment can support. There's Malthus for you. Now, here he comes and he says, okay, look, you when, when um, there's more animals than there is food, there is a struggle for survival. Somebody will die, okay? Now, off to the side... Um, when Darwin's first, uh, in fact, uh, taking, a, taking a step forward, um, when Darwin came back from uh, his voyage, he kind of, he, he, he gets married. Uh, he, he, he doesn't become a priest, by the way. He uh, marries his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, right? Whatever, dude, okay? Marries his cousin, Emma. Emma is a very firm Christian believer. Now, Darwin spent years he was he was a good scientist he was a naturalist he published like say for example the first book he published when he returned was actually a book on um, the variability of um uh s muscles I, I, that's not quite right i can't remember what they are mollusks that's the word mollusks so he's got all of these little seashell dudes and he shows look just like when you look at a human being, and some are taller and some are shorter, and some have darker hair and some have lighter hair, and there's this variability among them, same is true in the animal world. Look at these mollusks. Some are longer, some are shorter, some have more stripes, some have fewer stripes, some stripes are darker, some stripes are lighter. In the world of mollusks, there's the same type of variability as there is in the world of humans, and he extends it out and says, of course, in all animal species. And it turns out that some of these variations, whether they be taller or darker or something, are more conducive to survival than others. Remember that struggle for survival thing? Somebody's going to die? Well, here's the deal. It is this variation which determines who does live and who does die. Okay? In one particular environment, we find that, um, say, for example, giraffes that have slightly taller necks can reach higher. And so in times when there's not enough food, those giraffes that have longer necks are more likely than those giraffes that have shorter necks. As a general rule, babies tend to resemble parents. Not completely by any means, because there's that variation going on. But there is a tendency, if a giraffe has a relatively long neck, it is a tendency that its offspring will have relatively long necks. Now you hear me. And so, this notion of natural selection, okay? Natural selection, or here, then, well, there, I said that. Uh, natural selection is the notion that um, nature decides who lives and dies. These variabilities, whether it be long versus short neck, determines which animals live and die. Okay? It is a very interesting thing. The motivation is survival, not perfection. Um, a lot of people think that evolution is moving towards perfection. No. As the environment changes, the exact best solution changes. Animals go up, animals go down. In a different environment, imagine where a long-necked giraffe would be a bad thing. Um, if, if giraffes like lived on the savanna where uh, they ate from low bushes, then all of a sudden having a long neck would lead to an increased risk of death based on snap necks or something. And all of a sudden there'd be a selective pressure for shorter necks. Okay, We find, though, that um, this natural selection is the main main answer. Now, this is an interesting little side again. This is a history course. Um, 
in Darwin's personal journals, it seems quite obvious that for 20 years he's he's laying out this principle, this theory of natural selection. He's laying this out. He's already got it on paper. He doesn't want to publish it because he knows how much it'll hurt his wife, okay? Because she's this strong Christian and he just does not want to hurt her. But along comes this dude in uh, who's a different naturalist up in Malaysia, and I forgot his name offhand. I mean, that, isn't that the truth and he sends a manuscript to Darwin and in this manuscript he basically describes the principle of natural selection and he says to a Darwin hey can you check out my manuscript and tell me if this is this is any good or not when Darwin gets his manuscript he just goes he just starts his jaw drops he's like oh shit I've been working for 20 years on this bad boy and what is this dude comes along and just sort of drops it in my lap so Darwin who's in England uh, takes his uh, copy, his work, and the copy that he got from this guy from Malaysia, takes him to a friend, and again, I think it was Henslow, and said, I want you to judge these. And Hens Darwin, why don't you go home and write up your theory. Write it up, not just these journals. I see the evidence that you've been messing with this for 20 years. Go back home, write it up. So he goes home, writes it up formally, and they presented his work and then the work of... Uh, God, I can't remember the name, but the, the the naturalist that was working in Malaysia, Borneo, whichever, and um, they presented it to the National Academy. Of but here's the deal: it was the same essential theory, right? But Darwin had been spending 20 years. He wasn't just sitting idly in that 20 years. He was gathering all kinds of evidence to support his theory. So a theory. Compared to a theory with 20 worth of experimental research to back it up, okay? Clearly, Darwin's theory won, uh, and the poor guy, God, I wish I could remember his name. The poor guy's out there, he doesn't even know any of the shit's going on, because mail takes six to eight months one way to, to get there. So he doesn't even know that there's this whole thing going on, and he lost before he even knew he was in, the, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a game. It was just crazy, man. So, he writes um, on the origin of species, by the way, in his uh, 1865, I want to say. I don't know why I don't have that here. But anyway, on the origin of species was the original book. And I want you to know that in the origin of species, he never once mentions human beings. He never once mentions monkey man or anything like this. And he is completely, um, he's just so criticized. Again, Darwin didn't want to go there because he knew that would hurt his wife too much. He just didn't want to go to the connection with humans in evolution. So his entire book on the origin of the species never once mentions humans, okay? But everybody just read it and assumed that's what it meant. So he said, you know what? Screw it. 1871, he writes The Descent of Man, all right? That's where he finally comes out and says the thing that everybody's been criticizing him of saying for the last six years, okay? He goes further in the expression of emotions in man and animals and starts to talk about not only is this a, a strictly biological thing, but check this out. Human emotions are remnants of animal emotions, okay? We'll talk about this, but he starts to get into this whole everything you are today is a product of everything that came before. Okay, and this is going to be a huge, huge thing when we move into the biological psychology realm. It doesn't take a, a, a genius to look at the biology of the brain and see that it, it, it comes, comes from our ancestral environment. And so evolutionary psychology is a modern extension of Darwin's theory to explain human and non-human behavior, social behavior, not just a strictly biological thing. And we'll, we'll talk about this notion that Evolution, modern evolution, has not just survival of the individual, but survival of the genetic material. And so what we find is that behaviors which uh, support your offspring, even if they cost you something, make sense. If you, if you do a behavior that rescues two children but kills yourself, then it makes sense. From a strictly evolutionary perspective, it doesn't, but from a more sociobiological perspective, which is more modern, it does. We'll get into some of that again. This is a history class. I'm not, I can't get, get into all of that in the history class. 
but we will come back to this concept of evolutionary psychology when we talk about biological psychology much more towards the end, and we'll probably touch on it when we talk about psychology today and psychology into the future, because clearly evolutionary thinking and this fa the concept of ad adaptation is so infused in psychology today as to be... Uh, you can't remove it from there, okay? So we'll talk next time. We'll get back into that functionalism the next time. And again, what is the function? What is the purpose? Because Darwinian thinking in in, Euro, in, in Europe took off, but it, it really kept itself, confined itself to the world of biology. In America, Darwinian thinking not only captured the mind of, of um Psych of uh, biology, but it also captured the, f the minds of psychology and even the world of business. It was used um, in, in social Darwinism was an American movement where, where people felt that the survival of the fittest could explain and, and justify certain things. Okay, so we'll come back to that stuff as, as we're moving along, but I promise you we're not done with, with evolution. We're just done with evolution 101.